All right, we're going to do Renaissance art and architecture for this little series today. Um, things you should be able to pick up pretty easily as we go through this presentation. Humanism is going to be all over this uh, particular session. We're going to see interesting Greek and Roman classics, whether it be with the sculptures or whether it be through the art or the architecture itself. Secularism, we're going to see some movement away from the uh, religious themes and more towards the material world. Parts where this gets a little confusing, though, is a lot of the people who are uh, the patrons of these particular paintings who are commissioning these artworks are popes, and, of course, they're going to go ahead and have uh, some sort of religious theme when they do purchase those particular works. Uh, individualism, artwork, and new inventions like oil paints and perspective. Perspective is something we picked up on in the previous art lecture. Uh, you'll be able to see more of that in this particular uh, presentation. Okay, we can go ahead and start with the architecture portion. We see um, Greek columns and Roman domes. Um, when you look back to ancient uh, Roman ruins, they were big on columns and they were big on domes. Uh, you look at the uh, Pantheon in Rome, uh, it's just it's mainly a dome feature. Um, you see a lot of what's left in the Roman ruins of back in the uh, early 100 and 200 and 300 uh the AD era, uh, the, a lot of the things that are left are just columns, but columns and domes were big features in Greek and Roman architecture, and they start to make a comeback here during this Renaissance period. So, um, again, you know, the, it's not out of the realm of, of imagination to uh, make the connection between the two because Renaissance, they were trying to get back to the early days of, of Rome and Greek, so this is just one of those ways. Uh, oil paints are invented. Um, so we have this new style of painting, at least uh, this new method. Um, on the left, we have The Wedding by Van Eck. Um, and on the right, we have uh, Descent from the Cross. Uh, so you see Jesus being pulled down from the cross. I believe this is one of those uh, pieces of art where uh, it wasn't just one person who commissioned it. It was about three or four. And uh, you should be able to pick up on who those are because those are the people who are actually handling Jesus as he's coming down from the cross. So a little bit of vanity in there, um, you know, putting yourself in, into a painting, that, taking down the most, uh, in, the most important figure, so to speak, in, uh, in Christian religion. So just another example of, uh, of a little bit of perspective, too, because it's not close up. You have a number of people you have sort of a background going on as well. Um, just some more on it, like I just talked about individuals and the novel ways. Can you tell which ones paid for it? Probably this guy right here. I'm sure he probably paid the most because he's the one holding Jesus at the top. We're gonna go with these two guys here and then of course we probably have this fourth person here. Um, the rest of them are females. Uh, I really can't tell what that person is in the background. And very it doesn't matter so okay uh, back to the wedding that we showed earlier the thing that makes this painting so uh, so praiseworthy is the fact that you look at some of the small details that I'm sure were absolutely ridiculously difficult to do back then and even in today's time the mirror behind the uh, people being married um, shows their reflections right here um, so that would be something that if you looked at it the first time, perhaps you didn't um, you didn't pick up on that. It's just one of those things that after you start taking some closer looks and uh, at paintings and uh, admiring their particular fine details, this is one thing that surely stands out. Then we have the concept of perspective. It's invented by Giotto and perfected by his student Masaccio. Um, so one of the things that uh, you know maybe you've ever maybe you've not tried this before, but I have. Uh, back when I would had more of a, an interest in drawing, my, my biggest difficulty was trying to figure out how to make 2D figures on you know flat paper become 3D looking. Well, the way that that was done is through perspective. Um, so basically, the things that get small or become smaller the further they are into the background, and all straight lines point to a vanishing point. So uh, we'll talk about this uh, with. Uh, Oh, what is it? The School of Athens is a very famous painting that College Board likes to use as well, and they use vanishing point and perspective. So there's a line that goes through the particular painting, and then that basically serves as everything 
uh, below that will then be bigger and everything behind that should be smaller to make it look like it's 3D. And here it is right here. So as you can see, um, this is a rather 3D looking painting because we have uh, these gentlemen down here looking smaller. As I had mentioned, the things that uh, are at the bottom are typically bigger. The vanishing point is probably somewhere along right here through the center. And then as you can see, things become smaller as they get backwards. So School of Athens, um, some other things too. Uh, a question that sometimes comes up in testing is how does the School of Athens reflect Renaissance? Well, the reason why this reflects the Renaissance ideas is because if we recall back to the idea of the Renaissance, is they were trying to go back to the uh, early days of Roman and Greek philosophers uh, in their ideology, and each person that's featured in this particular painting is a Roman philosopher or a Greek philosopher. So that would be one of the ways that you can attack that question should you ever receive that in the future. Some other things, Mona Lisa, painted by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, it's a businessman's wife, so it's secularism because Mona Lisa is not a religious figure. Um, notice the background and perspective. We see that it looks as if she's sitting in front of a, uh, a picture, picturesque background. Um, the real, realism of her face has always made people wonder what she was thinking. Not me. Uh, I, personally, I just never could be a fan of this particular painting, but if you like it, fantastic. Another famous portrait in the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. by Genevieve de, B de Benchy. And I'm not real good at doing these particular uh, name pronunciations. Leonardo is also famous for religious works of art like The Last Supper. This also shows some 3D in perspective. Um, it's not the highest quality of, uh, of, of art in terms of what we can see, but it, it certainly has suffered over, the ti over time, so that's more why we have the poor quality, not because he did a poor job. He also did some other inventions too, some anatomical drawings. Um, did some baby in the womb, some other inventions, um, some of which were, were successful, some of them obviously were not. Like, I have no idea what's going on. This just looks like a garden rake to me, but I'm sure it was supposed to be something else. Greeks and Romans did freestanding sculptures. So here's a Roman uh, statue of Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Um, if you're not really familiar with who that was, if, you, if the name sounds familiar, though, um, if you ever watched the movie Gladiator, that's the old man... Uh, the old man emperor at the beginning who ends up being killed by his son, but that's who that particular is. So this particular statue is supposed to be looked at from all sides. Uh, we have Donatello. He copies some Roman styles. We've got a equestrian, equestrian statue of Gaudamaletta, statue of David, and the statue of Mary Magdalene. Um, the statue of David will be seen in the next slide. Okay. Um, so we have... Uh, Sculptures by Donatello on the left, Michelangelo in the center, and Bernini on the right. And if I recall, both the left statue and the one in the center are both supposed to be of David. Now one of the other things too that you need to focus on as far as detail is when they do these sculptures, they basically have this focus on the perfect human being. Not too many people, even in today's time, without extreme dedication, can have the type of physique that Donatello and Michelangelo display with uh, with David. If I recall, the statue on the left, if we were to get a um, a scene, uh, uh, me, a perspective from further away, I want to say that uh, David is holding the head of Goliath in that particular uh, uh, statue as well. And we can see that that should be David on the right as well, because as you can see right here, I believe that's probably the sling, and here's the sack of his stones that he would have used to uh, slay the giant. Uh, Raphael is most famous for his Madonna paintings, as we can see here. Da Vinci also painted Madonnas too. Uh, Michelangelo was known as a painter and a sculptor. Uh, one of the things that he's most famous for is the Sistine Chapel. Um, so with that, he basically had to lay on his back and paint the ceiling of the church. Um, again, this would not necessarily uh, represent secularism because this would be religious in uh, theme. Of course, it's going to be religious in theme because the church is painting or paying him for this particular painting. Uh, in the center and on the right, obviously, these are going to be religious themes too. I want to say that the center one is supposed to be Jesus basically coming off the cross and laying in. Uh, I don't remember if it was his mother or another figure within the Bible's lap, 
And obviously Moses, very prominent figure within the Bible as well, sitting on the right. Uh, he's also an architect, St. Peter's Cathedral, a wonderful place I've been inside of. Many types of statues that we've just looked at would also be found inside of there, as well as the remains of St. Peter. Some other things, we have some paintings as well. Um, as we can see, we look more towards, well, let's, let's take a moment to go ahead and, and do some comparisons between what we see in these paintings versus what we saw in the medieval art and architecture presentation. We see people with expressions on their face here, where in the previous uh, lecture or presentation, the people were very expressionless. They had no emotion on them. So this would be another improvement here. We have some women artists often painting other women or children. Um, honestly, I don't know what this thing is on the right, but I see pictures of it all the time. And uh, this particular presentation, as far as the subjects, I borrowed from another teacher and just putting my own spin on it. But I have no idea what's going on with this particular person. I'm going to assume that what happened is the painting probably got ruined, because other than that, it looks like a, like a werewolf baby or something. But anyways, that's not going to come up on a test. A Venetian School of Renaissance Art centers in Venice after the fall of Florence to the French. We see some other paintings here. Uh, obviously, whoever particularly put this painting, uh, put these slides in originally, out there. So, no, obviously that's not part of the original uh, painting. Late Renaissance art is often called Mannerist style. You have weird colors and elongated bodies that are typical. Um, the one on the right is more seems to be more of a representation of that. Um, I'm not really thinking personally that this looks like elongated body, but the, the 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 weird colors or so, you know, things that I perhaps wouldn't have seen um, in everyday life. Um, you can see that on the left. Obviously, the weird color aspect is going to be going on on the right as well. So, uh, El Greco was a court painter for the King of Spain, and here are some of the things that he put together. Um, on the left, obviously, you can see we're looking at perspective because we have a lot of scenery and a lot of background. Uh, on the right, we see um, where we're getting back into where he's likely going to be um, commissioned by some sort of religious leader. When we talk about the king of Spain in this particular uh, instance, uh, the king and qu kings and queens of Spain were very religious. Um, they often uh, tried to expel people who were not Christian. So... There's very well could be the reason why that painting is focused on religion on the right. Some other thing, uh, Philip II's palace was centered around a monastery. But other than that, let's take a look at some common things that we've already talked about. We go ahead and see the domes here. So that would be a carryover of the uh, Roman and Greek uh, architecture. Uh, Hans Holbein, Holbein was a court painter to Henry VIII of England, who we can actually see on the left. And on the right, we will see uh, his third wife, Jane Seymour. Let's see. It's divorced, beheaded, died. So she just died. She didn't get murdered. So and you'll learn that uh, Henry went through his wives pretty quickly when we get into the um, when we get into the uh, chapter 14, which is uh, Reformation. He also painted Sir Thomas More and Erasmus. These are two very uh, big figures in some of the topics we'll be coming up with later. Sir Thomas More was uh, uh, someone who wrote uh, the book Utopia, and we'll often refer to him as someone who kind of is basically the, I would say he's like the founder of socialist ideas or communist ideas, and you'll, you'll get a better idea what that means later on. Uh, unfortunately for Thomas More, he gets executed by Henry VIII. Um, for, for not accepting him as being the head of the English church. Uh, Erasmus will be someone who we'll be focusing on later too. He's a Christian humanist. He is not very f uh, fond of the changes that he has seen within the Catholic Church. He actually supports uh, Luther in his early endeavors to challenge the church, but then does back off later on. But we don't really need to know that for right now. That'll be something that we discuss when that time comes. Well, I think the ambassadors take a, take a look here how we have somewhat expressions uh, on their face, but we have more of a background and things uh, that have been added in that we wouldn't have normally seen in previous eras. Jean uh, Clouet, I'm going to go ahead and guess what that one, painted Francois I of France. Um, 
So again, some of these paintings, when we start seeing them of um, of kings, that'll be when we transition into Baroque, and Baroque was more of a painting style that was, the whole purpose was to essentially show how rich and powerful someone was. But Francois I was famous for building the chateau, such as Chambord. We see domes once again, so... Uh, not so much the pillars. Uh, here's some things that we did see carry over um, from the uh, from the Roman and Greek architecture as well, because Roman and Greek architecture was also big on arches, so we can see here. Uh, we also have Da Vinci designing a double helix stairway in, inside of that particular building. Now, when we get to Germany, religion stayed much more the central theme. Um, so you'll see some things later on that we talk about, like differences between uh, humanism and northern humanism, and really northern humanism will be things that happen in places like Germany, and it, as the slide already states, it's more centered around um, particular religion, and I'll just get on to the next one because this is going to be what I talk about anyways. Woodcuts, uh, a lot of times were those uh, that were being used. Um, so what a woodcut was is you basically make a carving inside of a wooden block and then it's used for a, a printing press. Uh, other things too, you would have carvings within uh, works of the uh, within works of the church too. So of course those are going to be uh, not secular in nature. Some other things that were were extremely difficult to do, uh, drawing self portraits. So those became a little popular at the time. Um, especially since really mirrors hadn't really existed yet. It was more of just you had like a reflective piece of uh, shiny metal that, that could actually work for a mirror. Um, moving on, uh, other things too that go on, uh, we have uh, scenes of everyday life. It's not really so much the scene of everyday life that I'd like for you to pay attention to in this particular painting. It's more of how much do they have going on in here. You know, when we looked at the old, ancient, the medieval ancient art ones, ancient time art, I'm sorry, medieval art portion, it was just really close on one or two people. Maybe at most it would get to three. And yet this person has gone ahead and made a very 3D looking picture with perhaps around 50 to 100, somewhere in the range of 50 to 100 people. I'm not going to count it. So, um, But as you can see, the closer to the bottom we get, the, the larger the characters become. And obviously, as we start getting towards the top of the paper, or the top of the work of art, excuse me, we see that they become smaller as well, so that would be perspective. You know, vanishing point is probably somewhere along here. Uh, Hunters in the Snow shows evidence of the mini ice age that occurred in the 16th century, so that's something that we talked about too back in the previous chapter where one of the things that was causing issues other than the Black Plague was also the mini ice age. So this is just one of those historical documents or uh, primary sources that would be shown as evidence of, of trying to support that that had actually occurred. Uh, Bruegel's works are often used on the AP exam. Um, so this is uh, the peasant wedding. So once again, we have more perspective being shown. Um, it's, uh, we have some expressions on the faces of uh, individuals, but again, we can see where it's more of 3D vanishing point, probably somewhere along right here. We can see that the people sitting on this side are certainly uh, put larger and larger scale than those sitting on the other side of the table, uh, with the exception of the ch small child here. Um, of course, they're just small because they're a small child. So that'll pretty much be it. The one thing that you should be able to do by the time we had finished this is you need to compare the paintings and architecture and styles of the Renaissance to that of the Middle Ages, noting how things have changed and how some things had stayed the same. That's going to be a historical thinking skill that we discuss called continuity and change over time. We do know that things did stay the same somewhat, but we had more of things changing. So the important thing is that you be able to do both. Tell me how things stayed the same and tell me how things did change. One other thing I'd like for you to be able to do during this time, it's not exactly going to be uh, something that occurred within this particular lecture, but you should be able to make the connection is describe the roles that popes had in Renaissance art. Sort of touched on it. Uh, you could probably use, you should probably, should probably use uh, information that you picked up on your reading to help develop a, a more thorough answer for this particular answer. And that's going to wrap it up. I know it was a little lengthy. This is probably the longest art and architecture one that we will go through this year. 
Um, so you still have the opportunity to go back and watch this anytime you like. This could be a useful study tool for when we get into uh, closing in on our final test date in May. So 